What's up, guys? We are back with the Guest List Podcast. It's early. It's not early in the morning. It's about 12 o'clock. I'm excited. I love when I can do a conversation or a podcast around this time. It's fresh. We haven't been weighed down by everything that's going on in the world. I have Lorraine Moss on here. She is a former Emmy-nominated journalist turned chef, turned podcaster, turned culinary counsel of Three Square. So there is quite a story behind this. I'm excited to hear and to get to know Lorraine. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm full of coffee right now. So. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I love it. I'm a sh- straight black coffee person. It hits harder. There's less of a crash that comes down. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm not that uh, serious about coffee <laughs> when it comes to like black coffee. I'm like more the mocha, you know, cappuccino with like a little bit of like cinnamon dolce or something. Okay. I, I mean, I guess coming from a chef, you know, all of the, the perfect spices that go into not just food, but drinks and everything that you're basically consuming. I mean, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing when it comes to drinks, because I don't consider myself like a mixologist or a barista or anything. At the same time, I get what you're getting at, because like, it's the same kind of flow when mixologists are working, they're thinking about what flavors go together. Um, I actually have a major respect for mixologists, because they do similar to what we do. um, And they're always thinking about flavors and how they go together. Yeah, I feel I feel the same with mixologists. It's funny because as we were talking before this and I work in a nightclub, when somebody wants a drink, there's literally just OJ soda water and cranberry on the table. So I'm like, you get like the most basic of drinks. There's no yeah. mixing to it or anything like that. And I'm pretty similar with my food. I eat like the same like 10 meals like at home. And then I kind of just do- indulge when I go out, when I could go to like restaurants that you're, you guys are cooking at. Yeah, I'm going to have to encourage you out of that, though. There's so <laughs> many things in the world that are so easy to put together that just are going to make your life so much better from getting the different flavors in your life. It'll inspire you for other things. Is that what inspired you to become a chef? Um, and before before going to that, actually, uh, we'll hold that because we'll start from the beginning. We'll make this easier on myself and on the audience members because being a former Emmy nominated journalist, you know, that's no small feat. So and then to go into becoming a chef, I'm sure there has to be something there. But let's go back to the beginning. You know, let's let's start as as your childhood. And just uh, give us an explanation of where you grew up and uh, how you ended up in Vegas. Wow, okay. (laughs) That's long story. But um, I'll try to condense it. It's just uh, we we have time. We have time. (laughs) Uh, I was born and raised in the Bay Area, mostly the East Bay. Um, I was born in a little town on the peninsula called San Mateo. Um, Our claim to fame is Tom Brady. He was also born there, and we were born in the same hospital about a year apart. So I just gave away my age as well. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so that's like our proud thing, Um, small town like outside of San Francisco. I lived there until I was 18. Um, My whole entire childhood, I had planned to be a lawyer or journalist. You know, like I had this idea I was going to go to law school and then, you know, I'd become sort of one of those journalist specialists that do, you know, the law and TV kind of thing. Um, and then it turned into lawyer and then it turned into journalist. So I always kind of knew that those were the two things that I was really interested in. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I went to UCLA and was still with that same idea. And then I just met a lot of people being in Los Angeles, you know, um, in the TV industry. And they told me, you know, like, oh, you should be on TV. Like you you just, you're so charismatic, you know, and you talk a lot, you can't stop talking. So (laughs) you might as well turn it into a career. Um, And so, yeah, I kind of went in that direction, got an internship at uh, KBC in LA and it started from there. And um, yeah, I loved it so much in LA. I was kind of like an LA girl at heart, even though I was born in the Bay Area, that I stayed there for longer than I should should have. <laughs> and um, I was there for six or six and a half ish years. So stayed after college, got a job as a production assistant in KB- at KBC. Um, and then just loved my Los Angeles lifestyle until I was like, eh, now I pr- should probably start to do what I actually want to do, which is be a TV broadcaster, a news broadcaster. And so um, I don't know if you know this, but like you have to start in some really like small town in the middle of nowhere. That's just the way it works, um, especially in television media, even more so than other medias. Um, So I had to move from Los Angeles to Iowa 
Oh, so, <laughs> what a change. A, a bit of a culture shock, um, but it was like the best thing for me because, you know, I've, I've traveled around the world with my family. Uh, we're multiracial, so, you know, we traveled into Europe and Asia and South America and Hawaii, like all these places, like across the country and across the world, but I'd never lived anywhere outside of the Bay Area or Los Angeles, so a super California girl, um, and it sucked for me at first. But I, I, I'm glad I did it because it pushed me out of my comfort zone in every single way. And, you know, all these things that I thought that I was like great at, you know, it kind of, it's always good to like push yourself out of your comfort zone so you can see what you're not good at. <laughs> um, and so it was like an adjustment for me. And of course I moved in December, like, Oh, what a bonehead right you know, into the peak just, of winter <laughs> it was terrible like my snot was like frozen like moving <laughs> stuff and I was like what the hell what am I doing like I moved from like the beach to like it was like a snowstorm and of course it was like a hundred year flood which is completely like random oh. um it was on the Iowa Illinois border and I was covering stories you know in like six feet of snow um I had hip waders that were actually chest waders on me like inside the middle of like a flood zone um all that kind of stuff um which I put like a stiffer stiff upper lip on while I was doing it you know because I'm one of those people that's like you know fake it till you make it I mean I've changed careers so many times you got to do that sometimes and I was like yeah I'm all for this and then when I'd get home I'd cry <laughs> 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 but no one knew it, you know? So um, I did that for two years, toughed it out, actually made some really good friends that I'm friends with now. So it was an amazing opportunity. Um, was like really afraid at the time, to be honest with you, like as someone, person of color, multiracial, and like moving from California, that there would be like all these people like discriminating against me. And it was like the exact opposite. Everybody was like super nice, hardly had any issues at all with anything, except for the fact that I was in the snow, like that sucked. Um, but yeah, I learned about another state and like another lifestyle, very different being in the Midwest. Um, but everybody was friendly and it wasn't what I expected at all. Then got a job, got an agent and got out of there and into Vegas. So the first time around in Vegas, I worked for Fox five. I started as a reporter here. Um, and then was, uh, didn't wasn't there very long as a reporter. They promoted me to Weekend Anchor, um, John Huck's position at the time. And John Huck was promoted to um, Main Anchor, which he is still now, um, and was there for almost seven years. Uh, it was one of my favorite wow. jobs. Um, and then as news anchors do, like I went from like there to Sacramento and Sacramento to Oakland and San Francisco. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's kind of like the goal for most people to get to those like top five markets, you know, like a San Francisco or LA or New York city did it for a few years. And then just <laughs> had this day where it was like, I came home and it was just another, it was actually a really bad, like rape murder, like children were involved. Uh -huh. It was like one of the worst stories of my life. And it was just like, I guess it was building and I didn't even know that it was building like that stress and the desire to not feel like this all the time and being in these situations all the time. And again, trying to put on that stuff upper lip and acting like it's not that big a deal when you know it is. Um, and it was the first time I'd cried in a long time um, being in the news business at that point, it was like 11 years. And I just told my husband, like, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I just can't do this. And, you know, instead of saying like, be strong and keep going, he was like, look, I've seen you, you know, like our, our entire relationship, that's all he knew me as. And he saw that I was coming home, like stressed out and telling him all these crazy stories all the time. And he knew, but he had never said anything to me, like do something else until I said it, you know, and he was like, you know what? You're not that old. You're not old at all. Change careers, do something else. And I was like, can I do that? Like, I'm 30. He was like, <laughs> really? You're 30? Like, calm down. You know what I mean? Like, you're not 90. Do what you want to do. And so he asked me the question that everybody should ask, which is, what would you do if you weren't paid any money at all? That was mm. the question that got me here. What would you keep doing if you had enough money to survive, you know, have whatever basic needs that you needed? But what would you still do? Because, you know, hopefully most of us wouldn't just sit on the couch and do nothing, watch TV. And I was like, 
I just, I would cook. Like I would make up recipes, like I'd be cooking all day. And he goes, well, why don't you go to culinary school? Um, so timing is everything. And at that point he had gotten a new job and um, he had an opportunity to move back here to work for ESPN radio um, in Vegas. Uh, at the time we were in San Francisco in the Bay Area and I was working at KTVU and he was working at, I believe it was called 95.7 The Game um, in San Francisco as a radio sports person. And so he had an opportunity to move back here, um, make more money and live in Las Vegas. <laughs> so that really said something because, you know, San Francisco is really expensive to live in. So to make more money than we were making in San Francisco and to move to Vegas, that was much less expensive. Oh, yeah, the cost of living here is so low. So right. low. Especially comparatively Compared to them. the Bay Area, it's like you're in poverty if you make under $100,000, which is ridiculous. Um, it gave me the opportunity, it's like timing is everything, to not have to work right away, you know, to do something new, to go back to school. Whatever I needed to do, he was like on board for. So we moved back here. Um, I went to CSN, thought I was going to finish out my culinary degree, and then just started thinking, you know, I need some, like, hands-on experience, and I had some mentors that were telling me, you know, it's, it's just like TV, where it's more about doing it than, like, learning about it in school. You know, you got to just get your hands in there and, like, learn what you can and start at the bottom. So I sent a ton of resumes out, showed up at Kitchens, and believe it or not, no one wanted to talk to me. It was just weird to me. Like I was willing to do anything, like put me in the corner washing dishes, like have me cut some stuff, peel some potatoes. And it's funny. Cause when I look back on it now, it's like, I would totally have hired me like for that reason, because I was like, so I would do anything, you know, but because of my resume, it was like, uh, yeah, we don't think that you're going to last here. Like one, one chef actually said, I'm not hiring a weather girl. I don't care what, what you want to do here, <laughs> which is hilarious because I really never did the weather. So, but it was just like his way of, you know, being condescending, I guess. And uh, I told my chef mentor at the time, um, Justin Franco, who I had met like at a, a Chefs for Kids charity event uh, while I was in school. I told him that. And when he heard that, he was like, you know what? I'm going to make a place for you in my kitchen. Like you're going to start in prep. You're going to have to, you know, do the grunt work. But if you're willing to do that, I'm going to like make room for you there. Even if it's for a couple hours a week, like whatever I have, I will make available to you. And so that's how I started. Wow. It's an incredible <laughs> journey all, all over crazy. the country <laughs> and mixing back and forth. So going back to, there's something that stuck with me is uh, when you were in the TV and broadcasting business and you'd mentioned that you felt burnout. Do you think that burnout stemmed from becoming desensitized from, like you said, like the murder and different things of that nature? Or do you think it was a buildup of things on the back end and the pressure and having to, to be in line to these like highly produced shows? Um, so it's a combination of many things. Um, I think the first thing that you said is, is the most important um, to like what started the transition, which was, it was like, not a burnout of like physical nature, because honestly, like physically, it's more tiring to be a chef than like any job I've ever had. Um, you work more hours and like you're on your feet all day long. Um, and there's just like kind of no excuses. It's like the military in some way. That's why they call it being on the line, right? <laughs> yeah, they run it like the military. It's like, shut up, say yes, chef, say no, chef, and like you do your work, you know? Um, so it wasn't that it was actual like emotional distress to be honest with you and it took many years to realize this and it was actually talking to a psychotherapist that we had on our podcast <laughs> of all things yes. um because we had coffee one day and you know she had, we had had a similar conversation about you know like how'd you do this how'd you go from this to this and then somehow we got into talking about like the news business and i told her i can't watch it <laughs> and she was like wait what and I was like, I, even the sound of it, like, I'm getting chills right now telling you this, because like, oh, wow. I literally would get chills from watching the news, and it could be anything, it could be about anything, it could be a traffic jam, and I'm like, <gasps> I'd get that sick feeling, like I was gonna throw up, and getting chills, and she said, um, okay, well, we're not in an office right now, but I can tell you, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. It's like, these are all the signs of post-traumatic stress disorder, like migraine headaches, like my mouth would get dry and like, I'd be like shaking and, and 
it's strange because you, in order to be successful in that business, you do have to desensitize yourself. And so all those years of just, you know, it's not that big a deal. Like that's a dead body, you know, like pretend like the smell's not there, eat your lunch in front of it, you know, like there's a child that's, you know, fighting for its life on the curb, you know, or a dog that didn't make it or a house that went up in flames. I mean, a kid that's kidnapped. I mean, it's just like day after day after day. Yeah, it sounds like it's like pulls the morality out of you. It, It can. And I think that I got out at the right place, you know, like that first moment where I felt that I can't do this anymore, like that real tension. And, you know, I wasn't desensitized to the point of not caring. I didn't want to get there. And so, and then like, you know, it's kind of like when you see things in hindsight, of course, it's like 2020 kind of thing, but it's like, you know, I remember moments where like, you know, I'd be standing next to another reporter who would be smoking a cigarette next to a dead body. And I would think to myself, what are you doing? Like, but you know, it's like, I didn't call it out at the time. I was like 20 something. And I was like, is this what people do? You know, I was confused. And then like, you know, having to eat lunch, you know, when they're like the people come to clean out the guts after dead bodies. Um, There's actual crews that do that. There are companies that, you know, they're like hazmat Mm -hmm. crews that come and do that. And the first time that happened, I was like, can we move, you know, like, can we move the van? And they're like, no, the life, the live shot's already sh- set up, you know, like, just eat your sandwich and don't worry about it. And it was like years of that, you know, and then just moments that I can think of, of like, just very vivid moments that I will never forget in my life, things that I will never be able to unsee, you know, so it's similar to war. And of course, I don't give myself, you know, that much leeway that I would say it's the same as war, you know, obviously not. I'm not trying to say that. Obviously, It, it no. creates P- PTSD that uh, <sighs> resembles it from a military career. So, yes. so I could see where that resemblance comes into play. But I guess it's pretty common and I didn't realize that it was. Um, and so, you know, like, I'm glad <laughs> that I got out when I did. And I'm glad that I didn't get to that point where, you know, I was so angry um, that, you know, some journalists are at that point and you can't really blame them to be honest because they're asked to be put in situations that maybe sometimes they shouldn't be in yeah or oftentimes I, I should say shouldn't be in i'm curious i'm curious about the the back end i can see how the the front end is, is could be traumatizing because there's so many different scenarios that can happen in reality but oftentimes the media is chastised more so for what happens internally as far as like the politicking and like climbing different career paths and story creation and things like that is it actually like that on on the back end is it is it tough to to raise and go from where you started to become like a a weekend anchor or a a tv journalist or things of this nature do you mean like competitive wise yeah like like competitive and kind of like how the movies make it out to be and people talk about how it's not as much as your skills as it is like becoming friendly with your higher ups and kind of showing that. I mean, I think that's honestly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Um, At the same time, you know, I'm not going to lie and say like there were points in my life or my career where I either got the upper hand or didn't get the upper hand because of certain reasons, you know, like news directors, they don't hide how they either feel about you or like the position that they're trying to fill. So, you know, there's a lot of, oh, well, you wouldn't work in Phoenix because you're not blonde enough. You know what I mean? Or, you know, we really do want you here because, you know, we want someone that with a Latin last name or an Asian face or whatever, you know, either way, it makes me uncomfortable, you know, like whether you're, you know, hiring me for that reason or not hiring me for a reason that has to do with nothing to do with journalism. Um, You know, it's like a role that they're trying to, you know, fit you into a category. Um, and like my hair and my makeup and my, my clothes, like, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Like I should actually do some sort of like a, you know, like a diary of it or something. Cause it would be hilarious just to look at, but like, I went from like black hair to blonde hair, to red hair, to short hair, to long hair, to curly hair, you know what I mean? To like, when I worked at the beginning of Fox, it was like super like sexy, you know? And it was like, well, wear tight jeans and tight sweaters. Cause you're in Vegas and that's kind yeah. of the, the superficiality of the city. Then I moved to the Bay Area and it's like, oh gosh, you dress like 
way too provocative, like, you know, black jackets, navy jackets, you know, like collars up to the the top, you know, it's just like hilarious, like how it like kind of changes, you know, and stuff. And so there's, there is that element to it. Um, but I think at the same time, like I get so angry nowadays about, and there's a lot to be angry about, to be honest with you, but like, I get so angry nowadays about how it's like, there's these terms of like fake news and lamestream media and all this stuff, like wherever it's coming from, I don't honestly give a fuck. The point is like, there's no credit given to people who are really good. And there are people that are really good. And I don't care like what station they work for or what news media outlet, or if they're like liberal or conservative or hopefully like moderate's probably the best way to be like, if you want to be a journalist. But I mean, I just hate that there's no credit given to like so many people who do this every single day and have had to put up with all the bullshit and still continue to put up with the bullshit because they have a higher purpose. And I would say from my experience all the way across the country, they're everywhere. (laughs) So it's not like 2% or 5% or like the few journalists that are like that. I would say more journalists are like that than not. Are there bad seeds? Yes. There are bad doctors and bad lawyers and bad politicians and bad everything, bad teachers, you know, bad cops, who knows? Like, Mm -hmm. but there's also like a preponderance of good in all those professions. That's yeah. That's amazing. And I feel like if anything, there's one thing that like, uh, it seems like both sides of the parties like agree with is that like the media is always getting it wrong somehow. And they're not that's kind of ridiculous to think that there are so many people out there that are working so hard in the conditions that they're working in and that they're not actually trying to get you the real story you know right right there's yeah there's a term that one of my favorite uh, commentators named scott adams he talks about how the two different uh media companies where he's focused on cnn and fox they're broadcasting the same story but they're kind of filtering it through two different lenses based off of whatever the bias is of the company so they you know therefore you're saying they are saying what has actually happened they just frame it a little differently based off of the, the audience that they're consuming in the town and i think that's true in some ways but i also think that there are there are journalists on both of those networks and msnbc and bloomberg and like whatever you want to be like listening to or watching that are not doing that. There are like journalists in the middle of those organizations that are still fighting really hard to be unbiased, to be real, to get you the right story, to not filter it through any lens and just give you exactly like what you need to know, the information that you need to know to make the decisions that you need to make in your life. So sometimes I feel like I get your point, but at the same time, I feel like sometimes people, you know, unfairly say, well, you know, I'm a conservative, so I'm not going to watch MSNBC. I'm a liberal, and so I'm not going to watch watch Fox News Channel. Like, there are definite issues with both of them. And personally, I feel like some are worse than others. At the same time, I see the good in like all those news stations. Right. Yeah. At the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's still jur- it's still journalism, and they're still going on and creating their crafting their different stories to whatever needs to be reported on. Because you see some of these places. I had this conversation actually recently where a lot of these small towns they don't have any reporting networks, no newspapers, no media on TV, anything like that. And without even just having the wrong frame on the actual story and having no story at all, a lot of people get away with fraud and different things of that nature. So it is yeah. important to have the news there, no matter what direction the frame is going. Exactly. I just honestly wish people would like try to listen more to Mm -hmm. each other, like whatever side you're on or if you're in the middle or whatever, just like listen, because I think any side has a good point, you know, unless you're just evil and you're a terrible person. (laughs) But like, if you actually have a purpose that's good, then it's like, we just have different ideas about how to get there don't have a different idea about what the actual ends are Mm -hmm. the good ends you know like whether it's making america better which is obviously really important or you know making the healthcare system better or you know whatever it is saving the environment just like there are certain issues i feel like shouldn't really be a political issue they should just be like look schools need to be better like what can we do to help teachers instead of like making it like a political issue you know right 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 so as far as, you know, building your passion into the project and framing different things, I mentioned that you were a former Emmy-nominated journalist. 
to be honest, I actually have no idea what that means. I just know that Emmy is attached to it, so it has to be something good. So can you take, <laughs> yeah, can you take me through the process of how what goes into becoming an Emmy-nominated journalist? Is this something that you build on your own and just, yeah, the entire process through it? Um, so when you work at the different news stations in different markets, um, you can, through the year, um, any journalists, um, and I'll, I'll speak from TV journalists because I'm more, most, uh, you know, I understand that the most. And that's, you know, Emmys have to do with TV mm -hmm. journalism as opposed to other forms of journalism. Um, you keep what they call a reel um, over a period of time. And you're keeping it for many purposes. It could be for posterity, which is good. Um, but most people are honestly keeping it to like make sure that, you know, when they want to move or when they're forced to move <laughs> to another job because they're laid off or fired mm -hmm. or whatever, um, that they have this ongoing reel, you know? So this ongoing reel is like proof, you know, that you've been somewhere. It's not like some jobs where you can just, here's my resume, you know, like, see, I worked here and here and here. Um, in TV, it's more important to have the actual um, live, live video that, you know, captured that you, you did, you performed, you made, you know, and so over time you would, you know, after work, you know, you'd save it. And nowadays they probably just have to save it on the web. You know, it's not like before you actually had to like record it um, back at the station, uh, but you'd keep it over time. And so with that, um, at the end of the year, you can enter, you know, different categories um, for the Emmys or for the Morrows or whatever, you know, like from the, the small like awards to like the big ones, you can enter these, you know, awards, you know, I guess apply for these awards. And so um, there's like these ones that are for specific stories. So like maybe you did a story in the category of religion or you did a story in the category of education. So you could enter that way. Or you can enter like the Lorraine Blanco, which was my last name, uh, my maiden name, Lorraine Blanco Composite, which is a bunch of my anchoring, or it could be a bunch of my reporting or both. Um, or your station could do it. Your station could say, you know, I'm gonna, you know, enter John Huck for best anchor, you know, in this, in this category or whatever. Um, and so that's how um, you apply. And then there's an award ceremony that takes place in different places regionally. Um, and then obviously we all know the National Emmy Award Ceremony as well. Yep. Um, but it's the same organization, it's Emmy. It's the lady with the like globe <laughs> and you get it. And then like they send you this plaque if you're nominated. So you still get like a plaque and or a certificate. You still get to go to the ceremony and like there's a red carpet and the whole thing. Um, and yeah, so um, I was fortunate to be able to be nominated several times in different categories um, over the years in Las Vegas um, for Emmys and I never won. I'm like a Susan Lucci of like the Las Vegas, not Las Vegas, the Pacific Northwest, which is our region, Emmys. So oh, oh, that's a huge that area. Works. I'm sure that's what dozens of stations. Uh, yeah, and it changes like over the years. So like, like at one point we were in the same, same category as like Los Angeles when I was there, which was like totally unfair if you think about it. I mean, there are certainly journalists like, you know, now and then that are at that level of like being like a big city journalist, but there are also people who, you know, this is their second job. That's what it was for me. Like I'd been in the business for two years and I was in Las Vegas, you know, and it's kind of not fair to be against like some guy that's been in LA for 30 years, you know, or yeah, some, with you know, much more land and stories yeah. that are happening as well. Yeah, and so then it, like, became San Diego, and, like, you know, it's just, it went from several cities to less cities, and also because, like, population increases and stuff. Um, so it, it's a lot of, you know, the Pacific Northwest, so up the coast, and, like, you know, parts of Washington, and parts of Oregon, and parts of Arizona, it just depended on the year it changed. Um, but, yeah, so there's different regions that you can apply for, or that your station can apply for, and, you know, they're the Emmy, just like the Emmy that you see on TV. Um, so yeah. That's awesome. It's because every time I come across like a, a reporter, an anchor, a TV journalist, Instagram or Twitter, they always put that there. And I'm like, obviously that has some sort of significance to it, but yeah. understanding what goes into it, now that you inform me, uh, it makes completely more sense. I would 
It, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a registered trademark, just like, you know, James Beard Foundation. Like, that's what it is for chefs, like a Michelin mm -hmm. star or a James Beard Foundation award. Um, it's similar, you know, in other careers, you know, it might be a Pulitzer or a Nobel Prize or, you know, something really lofty and amazing. Uh, but yeah, that's what that is. <laughs> Did, as you were a tenured TV journalist, did you take any of the skills that you learned from this profession and transferred it over to becoming a chef? I know they're completely opposite, but there, is there any sort of intangibles that you took with you? Yeah, so for sure. Um, I feel like my favorite chefs um, before I became a chef um, and then like as I was a younger, less experienced chef until now and I'm still learning, um, I loved what Jose Andres has always said about cooking is that it's a culinary, you're a culinary storyteller. And so that's how I always have kind of linked it. You know, it's like I told stories before, you know, like news stories, but now I'm telling stories through food. Um, and, you know, you can know and learn a lot about a person from the kind of dishes that they create and like the flavors that you taste when you, you know, go to their restaurant or eat in their house. Like it tells a lot about their background. And, you know, the kind of person they are, like, do they like cayenne stuff? Do they like to just chill and have like wings? Are they, you know, do they have like an Asian element in it? Do they have like, you know, uh, a West Indian element in it? Are they, you know, are they like full on like Southern? You know, it's like, it says so much about like where you're from and your experiences that led up to that point. And so I feel like that's like a huge um, similarity, the storytelling aspect of it. Um, and then, like kind of the obvious thing is just you know journalists are hustlers you know it's like they have to hustle like every single day of their lives and they're always like as good as their last story or as bad as their last story you know like you could have a career like dan rather rather and then like one day you do something wrong and it's like well suddenly Done. dan rather is an awful journalist which he's not but like that happens you know it's like then they have to dig their way their way out of it you know and it's like a chef is exactly the same. It's like you could be Jose Andres or Thomas Keller or Dominique Crenn and like one day like something sucks or gets burnt or like a steak goes out the wrong way or like something's not plated correctly or God forbid there's a cricket on your plate or something and it's like suddenly like wow he's he sucks he's terrible like how could this happen you know it's like my one bad meal so um there's just like a really like high uh like I guess what's the word I'm like having a, like, <laughs> it's like, you're only as good as like the last thing that you do. And so I'm fine with that. I kind of like living there in that place. <laughs> I'm a risk taker. So I like that feeling of like, oh, like I could do something amazing today and I could just totally like bomb and like go to shit tomorrow. You know, it's fine with me. I like living in that space. <laughs> yes, yes. Chefs definitely have to play both sides because you definitely get a lot of gratitude, right? When you cook something, mm -hmm, something yeah. well and the customer's like please give my thanks to the chef or right please buy something for them uh, on my tab or whatever the case is but then on the other side god forbid somebody gets sick then the world is falling and they're leaving bad yelp reviews or they're going to the news or they're saying your career is over so it's definitely a max give or take situation yes and in both cases because like when you are a journalist and especially if you're on tv it's like you could do one wrong thing, you know, like make a false move, like do something, say something like, you know, you were tired or you were like jolted up with coffee or like, you know, yeah. whatever's <laughs> happening that day. And you say something like that guy that said fuck off the other day was pretty funny. Oh, that was so <laughs> funny. That was but so like, funny. You know, it's like you get to a certain point, you're human, right? It's like, fuck off, dude. Like, I'm just trying to do my job like, fuck alone. You know, it's like, but that one thing, you know, it, it can burn you forever, maybe. <laughs> You, know, Can you, you could you could tell that guy was it was building up for the last four years you could tell he, he had the okay. biggest <laughs> smirk he had the biggest <laughs> smirk after that it was so funny i hope he gets like i hope someone makes him like a steak dinner or something because like uh there were so many times like i wanted to say that so bad so <laughs> and that was long before it was like this you know this much vitriol because when i was out there it was like toward the end of my um tv journalism career i was like really getting annoyed by you know the constant like things people throwing things from cars and like you know trying to get in front of your live shot or whatever stupid thing that they were trying to do especially here in vegas especially on new year's eve like that's one of the worst times ever to be like a tv reporter in the field it sucks it's terrible it's like your worst night ever 
Um, they actually have it a little bit better now because a lot of the time they put them on scaffoldings. But before when I was doing it, it was like, you're in the middle of that crowd. Good luck with the bottles like flying and like, you know, all the other crap that's going on and everybody's drunk out of their minds. Um, but yeah, like there are so many times, like I just wanted to like push somebody or like punch somebody or like say fuck off, you know, but never did. <laughs> oh, dude, the Vegas is really, it's the capital for so many different things. Obviously it's the entertainment capital. It's becoming one of the, the foodie destinations to go to, but it's also the capital of being a dumbass and ass hattery that goes on because yeah. people could just completely lose their minds and throw things like working on the strip the last 10 years, those five years at a pool and five years at a nightclub. I've definitely seen the, the latter ends of a person's personality where they just basically lose all inhibitions and all morals and values and they just let loose. But then on the other end, people also come with pristine personality and they're very like cordial and upfront with you. So you definitely get both ends of Vegas and all extremes. Yeah. And um, I mean, I used to be there in that industry. Like I didn't actually uh, work in the nightclub industry, um, but many of my friends did. And back in my twenties, when I first moved to Vegas, like that was my lifestyle. Yeah. It's actually pretty funny. Like I was like, I don't know. I partied a lot <laughs> from like 26 to 30. <laughs> a club rat, a club rat. We uh, all go like, through the phase. Oh my God. I was a club rat. And it's hilarious to me because sometimes like I meet people or I like, hear about people and like you know it's like that small town big town thing in Vegas and it's like I hear that like this person's still the owner of this club or the VIP host for this club and I'm like holy crap <laughs> like I've changed like two careers since then and like moved out and moved back and like he or she is like still in that club scene I mean like good for them like more power to them but I would seriously be like I'd look 80 years old if I did what I did when I was 26 you know like still yeah, the, the, the Vegas industry will definitely eat you alive, similar to the TV industry, because you're seeing, yeah. you're seeing a lot of the, the bad things that happen to, to people and letting loose with, you know, drug, drug abuse and yeah. substance abuse. And I mean, even just money. not sleeping. Like, mm -hmm. I never slept. I didn't sleep from, like, I don't know, like, Sunday through, like, Tuesday. And then it started again on Thursday. So, like, <laughs> I think I only took, like, Wednesdays off. Like, I was, like, serious. I, but yeah, I was very serious about partying back then. But, and that's the cool thing is once you live here, everything's for free and we're very spoiled. It's like, oh, there's no table service. I would never go to a club without table service. Yeah, isn't that funny? Or like my <laughs> motto back in the day was like, I don't pay cover and I don't wait in line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because like if you're part of the industry or you know people in the industry or, you know, you have that benefit of like being on TV or like, you know, whatever, like knowing people around town, it's like, you're like a mini local celebrity. And so it's like, you're like, mm -mm, no. Yeah. And I'm not paying for a bottle either. Like you're going to like give me a bottle. Yeah. The table. <laughs> there, there's going, once coronavirus is done and we were talking about before this, maybe beginning of summer when clubs can open back up to some sort of capacity, I think there's going to be a mad rush by not just the tourists, but the locals to go back out into the club scene because everyone's just been so weighed down at home and haven't been able to yeah. go out and express themselves and, you know, now we're all doing Zoom Zoom chats and Zoom brunches just to, to just to get by. So, yeah, I was just actually at Stadium Swim like the last I, a couple of weeks, a couple of times, and I was like, oh my god, I miss this so much. Even though I had to wear a mask, you know, and like <laughs> socially distant or whatever, I was like, man, I miss this lifestyle. Like so fun. Like they're bringing me food and drinks, and like I'm seeing like people, and I'm like you know, people watching and having like that great time, you know? So, um, yeah. Have you checked out stadium swim? It's amazing. I haven't yet. A few of my coworkers work oh. over, work over there now. I I'm a big football fan. I want to go and watch everything. And I've seen the huge, massive TVs. And oh yeah. Even if the, the water's cold or whatever the case is just to be out in that atmosphere is just something it's refreshing. Not. They're all heated. It's six heated pools and the cabanas there are amazeballs. So, and actually I will say as a chef, I'm quite impressed with the food. Mm. It's very good. There's like avocado tacos. There's lobster corn dogs. And like, I will say that their chicken is like really, really good. I'm like a chicken, like tender fan. Like that's my lowbrow fun thing to eat. And like, I'm like chicken. It's like crispy and salty. And like, it's really good. So you know, you know I've noticed, 
what I've noticed recently is like the culinary signature foods are starting to pop up more and more. It's not just chicken tenders before, because when I worked at Planet Hollywood as a cabana host, it was literally basic. It was like, you get like a chicken wrap, you get chicken fingers, fries, one of the like five meals. But now when I go even to like restaurants, I live in downtown Vegas now in the arts district. And I got a bunch of- lucky. Yeah, I live at Cher. It just opened up recently. It's a a beautiful- Beautiful I'm going to have to look here. at it because, like, I'm actually thinking about moving to downtown. Highly recommend. It's a Sam Cherry development. Just had him on here to talk about it. And uh, a bunch of the restaurants down here, just amazing. And Yeah, they're some of my favorites right now. Very, very, very specialized with, with all the foods. I've seen, starting to see things pop up, like you were saying, uh, the lobster corn dogs was popular. That's, like, a few bars here. And people are yeah. starting to, to signature, signaturize different foods at all of these restaurants because Vegas is becoming like that go-to food capital of the world. It's definitely a food town. It used to only be um, like a place where you either did like super low end, like I'm going to have a steak for two ninety nine at three yes. o'clock in the morning, or I would go to like Joelle Robichon and have like, you know, a $600 a person meal. Like it used to be like that, you know, it's like, there was like not a lot of in between and it was all on the strip. And now it's like, you can go to Summerlin and have something amazing. You could go to Henderson and have something amazing. Um, and then you could go to Southern Highlands and like the blue diamond area. And of course for me, like right now it's downtown, downtown yep. Las Vegas is the place to be. Like it's where all the happening things are going on. And it's where like the hipster people are in a good way. I'm saying it in a positive way. Um, and there's just like this like cool local aspect to it that you know, for Las Vegans, that can be kind of difficult. You know, it's like you get kind of stuck, especially like, you know, your mm-hmm. nightclub lifestyle or your, you know, like your chef lifestyle maybe or whatever. And it's like, it's so vegas everywhere, like Vegas touristy. And so like downtown doesn't have that feeling if you get away from like, you know, that main drag of like, you know, where like the laser light show it is, which is mm-hmm. cool, but it's like very touristy. If you get out to Fremont East or the Arts District, Man, that's like cool Las Vegas local. It's like the definition of Las Vegas Dude. local right now. Esther's Kitchen, Taco Tarion, uh, even mm-hmm. Ber- Berlin, the bar, 18 Bin, like all of these different yeah. restaurants. And there's a ton of, yeah, like Mexican restaurants and, that have popped up out here too. And so many more coming. It's mm-hmm. crazy. Like I am so excited for Main Street Provisions, Justin Kingsley Hall. Yes. Um, it's any minute coming. Um, super excited for that. Um, I have not gotten to good pie yet, but I heard it's crazy good. Um, Vincent Rotolo. So, um, and I, I love Taco Terry and like their tacos there. Like I'm not fully plant-based, but I like to have like at least one meal a day plant-based for health reasons, for environmental reasons, for a million reasons. Um, I like to do at least one meal a day and then I'll do like days of the week too, where I just eat plant-based completely and when I go there I don't feel like I'm missing anything you know it's yes. like they've got an all pastor vegan taco there that takes like as good as any all pastor taco like I will fight anyone that says <laughs> I've, I've really opened up to vegan food maybe just because vegan just then the entire thesis of vegan and the food is starting to take form with you know beyond meats and different uh, emphasis that's happened on it mm-hmm. but specifically with like taco taran a lot of times you wouldn't even tell that it's like a a vegan meal just by Mm -hmm. the like blend of all the different flavors that are happening for sure and like there's so many discoveries being made and that's the part that really excites me as a chef it's like we just had on or this week actually we have on um sundown mushrooms oh i listened to that one and it's like the idea of having mushrooms that taste like bacon or pulled pork or lobster or chicken it's like there are so many possibilities. Like my chef had just like, like the mind blowing emoji, you know, like I started to think (laughs) of all these things that I could do. I'm like, Oh, if it tastes like a lobster, could I like thinly slice it and make it into like a lobster sashimi, but not have to kill a lobster, you know, and be able to feed my plant-based friends and family. Um, Also, I mean, as we know, like there's a mushroom revolution going on right now um, in the foodie like world and mushrooms are being like researched um you know in like highly important institutions and they're finding that mushrooms can heal so many things like not just not just prevent things but heal things and Mm -hmm. so there's like you know ideas that it can like prevent heart disease alzheimer's 
um, help with fertility issues, like all kinds of crazy stuff that sound crazy. But then when you think about it, like it does make sense that the earth provides you with what you need. Like Ex- as, exactly. as hippie as that sounds, it's why, why would we be here if there wasn't like a way to like help things naturally, you know? Yeah. So I've, I, yeah. I've, I've been taking uh lion's mane for probably about a year now off and on there's a lot of like starting yes it's perfect it gives you a lot of clarity i haven't taken it recently since we closed uh since uh, since uh kind of the strip closed and everything like that but there's a lot of nootropic properties with with lion's mane and there's like four main ones but i used to go buy coffee from this company called four sigmatic have you ever heard of it no, but I've heard about mushroom powder and coffee before. Yeah, it's per- it was like my favorite thing to wake up to. You just feel a lot of clarity, but you don't feel like that anxiety sometimes from the coffee. Huh. And yeah, and I was able to retain a lot of information throughout the day without having like that haze towards the end of it. And you're kind of like, shit, what I do the rest of the day? Yeah. Uh, so Myrene De Los Angeles, the, one of the owners of Sundown Mushrooms, she just like socially distanced, dropped off like <laughs> um, a mushroom growing kit here. So it's sitting on my counter right now and I can't wait for the like little um, science experiment that I'm going to be doing on later on in the day. Um, it's a lion's mane. Um, so it's like all the materials that you need to grow your own lion's mane mushroom. Um, she says that it's going to grow to bigger than my head. So I'm really crazy excited about this. I am going to be testing like some new like lobster things and chicken things and make um, a decision on my own, whether it tastes like a lobster or chicken. Um, and it's going to be crazy. It's like a little science experiment. It looks like a bag of aliens. So I'm like really excited to start it. You could buy it on her website. So I'm really like. Mm, I'm gonna have to look into that mushrooms are always my go-to that's my favorite my favorite vegetable it's always the uh, topping that I get on pizza Uh Uh, definitely and mushrooms now even just going on the other side of mushrooms that they were the psilocybin mushrooms were legalized in Oregon so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, positive positives to it that isn't just the typical food uh, edible type as well Oh yeah. I mean, I've been, you know, I just started, I get into these modes where like, I get super nerdy about books. <laughs> they don't just sit here. I like literally read them every day. Um, no, I'm going through this nerdy phase because of my reading um, and sundown mushrooms, but learning more about mushrooms and like these like really cool, like um, mental like situations that they can like get you out of or into, you know? And I think that's, interesting it's super interesting like the idea that it can reduce anxiety and stress and like you know help you sleep better and like you know i just i love that yeah psilocybin is being used primarily for treatment of ptsd and war veterans and i know a wow. lot of, yeah, i have a lot of anecdotes. maybe i need that <laughs> <laughs> right you're right on the line you're back in it <laughs> in that uh, yeah, when I was in college too, I used to actually experiment with a lot more than than recently but there's times where you know I'd have girl trouble break up with a girlfriend and we'd, we'd take mushrooms and you'd just be like completely accepting of of where life is headed and you're just like okay like now I'm very in tuned with with my emotions I'm not overthinking things uh I'm it's just very accepting so I'm a big proponent of all mushrooms together I'm totally one of those people where it's like whatever works like you do what works for you and um, whether it physically works which I believe I honestly believe that this stuff does or it's like some sort of placebo effect because the, again, the end result is the same. If you feel less anxious and you feel like less stressed out and you're happier and you're in a better mood and you can like function better in your life and be nice and kind to people, then I'll take it, you know, just whatever works for you. There's so, there's so many, so much nuance to food and ingredients and edibles and there's so many different properties to it. Uh, if, if the strip or just if Vegas was open back up and you could open up your own restaurant, what, what type of uh, specificity would you go into um, as a chef? Mm. I've been actually thinking a lot about this and not because I actually want to open a restaurant because in the beginning that was sort of the desire. It's the desire of many people that go to culinary school or have an idea about being a chef. Um, but now I'm just kind of like, Oh, it's not worth the stress because I just see my, my friends, they're just dying right now. You know, it's just like so stressful. 
Um, but we'll play that game, you know, that I talked about, like the, the, my husband's game, which is if it didn't, the money didn't matter because it's just like the, the profit margin is so low right now on, on restaurants and not just in the pandemic before the pandemic, this was an issue. Um, so if money wasn't an issue, um, I'm really like, so, um, I think this happens to a lot of chefs. You work in other people's kitchens and you work in, you know, if you really want to learn a lot, you're going to work in a bunch of different chefs' kitchens and in a bunch of like styles and cultures. So you might learn, you know, um, African food, you might learn, you know, Middle Eastern food and like, you might learn how to cut sushi and like make Japanese food. And over time, you know, most of us start like with French classic, you know, technique. Um, but you're kind of always, you know, away from like, what you grew up with in many ways. And so what happens is you learn all this stuff and then you do what Sheridan Sue has done, who the owner of like Fat Choy and um, Every Grain and Falk and Fell, and you'll come back to your roots. And so his roots are Taiwanese. So he's doing this like amazing pork rice now at Every Grain and that's what his grandma made for him. And so I'm kind of thinking like that, which is if I were to do something like that, I would come back around and like my background is like Portuguese and Asian. And there used to be a few restaurants across the country, one that was really famous in Chicago that did it, but very few restaurants to do the style. It's called Mechanese food. Um, it originates from Macau, which used to be run by the Portuguese. Um, it's off of China. Um, so Hong Kong and Macau, um, they didn't belong to China for generations. And then, you know, in recent modern times have gone back to China. And so those cultures are like, the Macau culture is very Portuguese and Chinese. The Hong Kong culture is very like British and Chinese. Hmm. And so they're a little different than, you know, the rest of China. Well, I shouldn't say a little, a lot different. <laughs> like, you know, politics and like culture and food and everything's different because of so many generations of like, you know, you know, whether you are okay with it or not, colonialization, you know, to mm -hmm. be honest, you know, it was like conquering of like other cultures. Um, but because of that, there's like this amazing, like mixed food culture, you know? And so to me, like what I grew up with was a lot of like that Latin and Asian, uh, my sister and I call ourselves Latasian. And so it would be that, yeah, it's crazy, right? Um, so that's what we call ourselves. And so it would be a Lat Latasian cuisine. So um, just imagine like, you know, um, you know, a, a burrito that had like Asian ingredients in it or, you know, nachos that had like, you know, bulgogi on them or whatever, you know, and oh, it wouldn't be like one Asian up. culture <laughs> or one Latin culture. It would be several because I'm several Asian cultures and I'm several Latin cultures, uh, Portuguese, Filipino, Spanish, Italian, Hawaiian, Thai, um, just got oh, my wow. uh, ancestry uh, DNA thing back. And apparently, like, I have some family from Myanmar as well. So I'm just, you know. All over. I'm a crazy melting pot of flavors. So that's what I would want to do, you know. And, of course, with, like, a modern twist. So that's what it would be. Wow. I I don't even know what to say at that point. It just it sounds <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like something I want to be a part of just because every time I go out to different restaurants, um, people just bring these different influences of their backgrounds and now with Vegas is probably the biggest melting pot in the country as far as culture maybe in the world and so that's one of the reasons I could see why Vegas is starting to become the foodie capital because of uh, people like yourself that have so many influences from their background that you want to represent but then you also take influences from the restaurants that you work in mm -hmm. create something so specific to you that your restaurant or your food just becomes the, the melting pot or hot, or hot spot to go to. And it's not just something that you see on Instagram pictures. It's something you can actually taste. Yeah. I mean, it would be so far fetched for me to say that I would open a restaurant like this. Cause like I said, I've kind of given up on that idea. My husband every day is trying to get me to like do a food truck, which is like, God love the people, bless their hearts for doing them. But it's like, the worst, craziest labor of love ever. I know so many people that have had them and like gotten rid of them because they're such a hassle, you know, like yeah, I'm, it's I'm just having, hard. I'm having the, the owner of Raging Tacos come on in a few weeks to talk it's about that whole experience. Very difficult, you know? And like I said, bless their hearts because the ones that are good are really, really good. I'm not saying that they're not good. I'm just saying, shit, like that's a labor of love. Like it's hard. It's really hard to make money, uh, especially in Vegas because there's so many months of the year where it's like way too hot for people to like hang outside and like 
line up for a food truck. Mm-hmm. It's not like San Francisco or like, you know, Portland or even Los Angeles where it's like, oh, well, most days of the year, it's not that bad. You know, like we'll do that, you know? Um, so it's a little bit more difficult here. There are a lot of challenges in Las Vegas. Plus it's not, we don't have a lot of places where like, you know, like in Portland where they have like a whole area, you know, it's just dedicated to food trucks. It's a lot harder here to get permits. It's really hard to get permits. Um, so yeah, so probably not a, a <laughs> food truck either. So the way that you would see this would probably be like in a pop-up situation where I would pop up somewhere. There's some really cool places now that are doing these like commercial kitchens or like Jolene Menina is just about to open the Las Vegas test kitchen, which would be a perfect place to do something like this. It's like, you go and you test out your recipes or just for one night only, like the rain mosses, like random Latasian extravaganza happens one yeah, dinner, these, one night. <laughs> these are becoming super popular. I actually had on Peter Klamka who owns the blind pig and he's doing a uh, ghost kitchens where yes. it's a multi-purpose kitchen of maybe yes. four to five different restaurants. And then they do like only delivery service for it. Yes. We actually are working on that too. <laughs> we just interviewed some people with like ghost unit kitchen. So um yeah it's something that it's the wave of the future mainly because we've been fortunate in this position of like it's so hard to have your own business especially at this moment so rather than just completely giving up on it you're gonna like join forces and mash up with like another chef that's in the same position as you yeah highly recommend talk to peter he's been in a lot of uh, articles all over the country about where he's he's taking that and he's doing it in la and like a few other cities as well but it's smart because a lot of people don't want to leave their homes and it's not just that's not just a trend of coronavirus i think coronavirus just kind of accelerated that trend that was already happening absolutely absolutely because there were already people especially in bigger cities than ours that were trying to you know, like maybe reduce their carbon emissions or increase the time with their families and doing, you know, like half the week at their office and half the week at home. Like this was happening a lot, you know, especially in the Bay Area. Like my dad did that for many years long ago before it was cool to do. Um, It's, it was something that was kind of happening like in the background. And now, like you said, with the pandemic, we're all kind of forced to that position and then realizing, you know what, it's not that bad. It's actually kind of cool to save gas and like not have to park and like drive and be in traffic. And I have more time to like sleep at night so that I can get up later and I don't have to like do that drive to work, you know? So, so so beneficial and something that's become more accelerated is something like we're doing right here where podcasting are becoming uh, more remote it saves so so much time it takes away mm-hmm. a little bit from the authenticity and like the social cues of being in person For but sure. it, it is a time saver and it's opened up the accessibility to talk to pretty much anybody because all you have to do is open a computer now and you don't have to vet people as much to you know are they the craigslist killer are they wh- whatever right? they, whatever <laughs> yeah, the, the background the background is to it and so uh i want to talk about your your podcast two sharp chefs and a, and a microphone because I didn't learn about you guys actually until a few months ago when we, we had the, the same guest on. And I was like, oh, she was actually on your guys's. But I think, some, I think your guys' show is uh, showing emphasis on something that we've been discussing this whole time uh, within the food industry and the ever-evolving nature of it in Vegas. Uh, so you just want to give us an explanation of your show um, and what you're trying to accomplish. So um, I'll start with, from the beginning on that, which is um, – so Louis, Victor, and me, uh, we started this podcast about a year and a half ago. Um, it would be like 2019, June, June 2019. Um, and it was because of Anthony Bourdain. But we'll rewind a little bit, which is that we worked together many years ago. Um, it was my second job in the industry at Bazaar Meet by Jose Andres. For me, that was a really, really, well, it's a big deal for anybody, but it was an especially big deal for me at the time because it was only my second job. And to be completely honest with you, I was only six months into the industry. So my mentor had, you know, brought me into Gallagher's Steakhouse, which was at New York, New York, awesome New York Steakhouse, you know, just American, straightforward steak, potatoes, macaroni and cheese, like that kind of thing. And they did it really well. I moved up pretty quickly in there. Um... I had a lot of cooking background from just like background from my childhood, but not professional cooking background. I'm just a hard worker and I really wanted to succeed. So I went really early and stayed really late and actually got to the point where my mentor had said, you know what, I think you need to move on. 
because you've worked everything in this kitchen and you're, you're ready to go. You're ready to keep going. Saw the opportunity as SLS was opening. There was a bunch of restaurants and I was like, are you serious? Jose Andres is opening like a brand new restaurant. And, you know, he was on my radar for many years, you know, even before I was in the business. And I thought, I'll just try, you know, who knows, like probably have a very, very small chance, but I'll try and was able to convince the chef to take me. So um, I was super excited. And when I started there, I was one of like two or three people that had the, ex like close to the experience I had, that they still had more experience than me. I mean, literally had the experience of like a kid there that was 19. <laughs> um, there was a kid that was 19 um, that, you know, um, later on took under my wing because he's like so much younger than me. Um, but like we had the same level of cooking experience <laughs> and then everybody else there was like, yeah, I worked at Picasso. I worked at Guy Savoie. I was from Robichon, you know, like I'm from Bouchon and I'm just like six, six months at Gallagher Steakhouse, like, you know, like super quiet. <laughs> um, so anyways, I worked my ass off there, got my ass kicked so many nights. They, in the business, they call it in the weeds. I was weeded so bad. So many nights got yelled at, cried, got into fights cried in the walk-in like it was just like the first couple months um yeah they call it um breaking you in and so the chefs had kind of known that and this is common this is not just at bazaar or anywhere but like some of the sous chefs and cooks had found out like my little experience and they took it out on me oh. like it was terrible <laughs> it was like ruining things that I had prepped and like throwing things away and like just the whole thing you know yelling at you like telling you're doing anything wrong getting in your face like all kinds of stuff and you know what though it's like basic training <laughs> like I made it through it um again I would hide in the walk-in to cry or I'd cry at <laughs> home um but they never saw me cry so there's that they were like really you cried like so that's good um <laughs> Uh, like there were moments literally when like I would go to like make bread in the oven and the sous chef would run in front of me to like take it out and be like, you're too slow. <laughs> <laughs> like, the small and, things you don't even notice. Yeah. Just like crazy stuff. Or like you would cut like chives and chives are like in fine dining are like, um, you have to be, you have to have a really sharp knife and you have to be a really uh, you have to have really nice knife cuts not to ruin them. And, you know, at a place like Bazaar, it's like they've got to be perfect and exactly the same. And they're like, you know, like teeny tiny. Fine. And you do it in a little nine pan, it's about this big, and you cut the whole thing. So imagine that, that tiny in a whole nine pan, it probably takes you, you know, especially if you have no experience, like 20 minutes, you know. And then they would look and be like, mm, some of these are uneven garbage <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, confidence like killer <laughs> yeah and then it's like in the beginning I was like are you serious you know like talking back and then I learned very quickly which I needed to do that you don't talk back to a chef you do it and you shut up and you keep going you know so I learned a lot of lessons <laughs> hard ones um and learned uh humility which is something that everybody needs to learn especially in a professional kitchen um just how to take orders because you don't realize it until you become a chef I think a lot of the time that like it's so necessary to keep everybody in line in order to get stuff done and to get it done well you know especially in a busy kitchen so at the time I was really upset I was sad I was angry all those kinds of negative emotions but in hindsight it was like the best thing that could happen to me so um one of the people in the kitchen who did never gave me any shit but was like way more experienced than me was Louie and we became friendly and I found out that she you know her passion was photography she had a background in television but like technical like behind the scenes she worked at another station um like on this on the floor you know as like a stage person um production assistant like different jobs like that that are behind the scenes uh had a degree in AV and I was like this is like completely opposite of me but I was like you know there's always been the dream which I had from the beginning which was one day when I'm good enough and I feel like I know enough to do this and I'll never know enough to be honest with you, like to be what I really want to be, which is like awesome, awesome, awesome chef. I'll never be there. So that's fine. I'm okay with that. But I, f I realized and figured that at one point I would be ready to move back into media 
but with the, the food background. And so that was always an idea. So we would have these like dream discussions when it was not busy, you know, as, as you know, in hospitality, oh, there are yeah. these moments when it's like slow or like it's a slow night or whatever it is. And like, there's a lot of time to get to know your coworkers. And so I learned that about her and then she learned about my background. You know, she only knew like, oh, she used to be in the TV business, you know, but there was a passion that I had for storytelling. And she's like, you know, one day we should just do a show together. And we were both like, yeah, let's do a show together, you know? <laughs> and then we went on our separate ways. Like after I left, um, I actually moved to Los Angeles to go work with Susan Vinegar and Mary Sue Milligan through the James Beard Foundation mentorship. When I left, we still were like keeping in touch and um, talking about like a possibility of one day doing something together. So then two things happened. <laughs> one, um, which was like big deal to me, was fast forward to me working at Joe's Stone Crab um, at Caesars. I fell, had a really bad accident and had two labrum tears on my shoulder. I don't know if you're familiar with labrum tears, but like, it's like a baseball injury. So when I fell, I slid on some mashed potatoes, which is kind of hilarious, but <laughs> not really, you know what I mean? But things happen. So it was at the end of my shift and I was taking inventory, which chefs have to do. There's a lot of paperwork involved with being a chef, maybe even more so than cooking when you get to that, you know, management level. So I'm just doing paperwork, of course. It's not like something that actually is like dangerous. Um, I'm holding a clipboard and I slip on mashed potatoes and go flying. And um, I did a little sliding into home thing with my arm, uh, which is not smart, but I was trying to protect my head. And because I did that, I separated my shoulder, my from tear, front and back. So I had to have a major surgery. Um, and I was out for a really uh, long yeah, time. Yeah, that's like a nine month injury. It was awful. It ended up being like a little bit more than a year. So um, it was like rotator cuff and like two labrum tears. So I was like, couldn't do anything. I couldn't do the job that, by the way, I like changed careers to do. Oh, that's hard <laughs> and I was just like, fucked. <laughs> and, um, and then the, the man that both Louis and I like looked up to, Anthony Bourdain, both of us, we had this in common where it was just, he was so interesting to us because he was um, a chef journalist, which even though in his lifetime, he never considered himself to be a journalist, he was clearly a journalist. He was telling stories about chefs and cooks and culture, you know, traveling around the world, doing his shows. And we just were both obsessed with him. Like we both thought this is like something that we want to do one day, you know, cause she was visual and she was like into photography and like, tr she was a major traveler. And then I was a journalist. So and we both had the food background. So that happened. It was an awful day for us. So we talked about it some more, like, what can we do to fill in the space? Obviously, we're not Anthony Bourdain. We don't claim to be. We, don't, we will never be. But what is something that we can do to fill in the space? So then, as it came to the one-year anniversary in 2019, in June, um, Eric Repair, the famous La Bernadine chef, and Jose Andres, um, our old boss, our jefe, <laughs> um, they asked for hashtag Bourdain Day on social media. And it was like maybe like a month before his birthday, maybe even a little bit longer. And we thought, you know what? Like you have some time right now, which Louie at the time was like working less jobs than she works now. And I definitely have time because holy crap, I can't do anything. Like I literally was having a hard time. Like I couldn't put on my bra. Like, so let's oh. be like, to be like honest, you know what I mean? I couldn't reach behind me. It was just like a terrible time in my life physically. I was like, well, I can write, I can talk. <laughs> I could produce. So she's like, why don't we do a podcast? And we do it in memory of Anthony Bourdain because Hefe, which is what we call him, our boss, Hefe, even though he's not our boss anymore, is asking us to do something in memory of Anthony Bourdain that's positive, you know? And I was like, a podcast? Like, and honestly, I was like, I had listened to like one podcast before then. And she was like totally into podcasts. So I just started like listening to the podcasts, listening to different podcasts, especially food ones. Um, and I was like, oh, I totally get like what this is. You know, it's like a very niche market, which is perfect because we're talking about something very specific. Um, and it made sense. Like our whole idea was filling in some sort of gap that Anthony Bourdain had left behind, which was giving chefs and people in the hospitality industry a voice. 
So that's how we came up with the idea of two sharp chefs and a microphone, which my husband named. It's um, in reference to two turntables and a microphone. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Beck, please don't sue us. Um, <laughs> no, we don't use the music, so you can't sue us. Um, so we're 90s babies. So um, two sharp chefs and a microphone. Um, and it was about two chefs uh, talking to chefs about chef life. I like that. Sharp chefs in a microphone. And then it expanded because, as you know, over time, like, your ideas start mm-hmm. to, like, flourish. And you think, well, chefs are important. And, like, yes, we're two chefs talking to chefs. But what are some of the things that chef need, chefs need for support? You know, like, and one of the first things was mental health, like, because of what had happened with Anthony Bourdain. And as we know now, like, our industry is, like, has so many people that are struggling with mental health. And so let's talk to a clinical psychologist, like about some of the issues that might happen for chefs, for restaurant people, the lifestyle, you know, just just like the nightclub lifestyle, similar issues Um, because of when we're up and how long we're up and like the stressful, like insomnia, everything. Yeah, and, like, the things that people do when they're up late, you know, like, the abuse that can happen, like, with drugs and alcohol and all kinds of things, maybe even sleeping pills to, like, try to sleep and try to wake up and all kinds of things, right? So we wanted to explore that. So that's where we started, um, seriously. And then we thought, you know, also, like, let's be fun. So we started with that, and then we started with, you know, um, our favorite chef movies. (laughs) Are they real? Like, (laughs) How accurate is Chef the Movie? How accurate is Ratatouille? Like, That's a fun idea. I like that idea. Totally opposite, right? It's like mental health. Like, let's try to do something really great for the community that they need. Okay, well, let's just have fun too, you know? And so it started there. And then from there, it grew into where does the food come from? How do we sustain ourselves? Um, you know, there are people in the beverage industry that, like, we need to talk to. Like, what's a master sommelier? What does he really do? How does he get there? How does she get there? Like, and so it opened up these other topics, but it's still on point of having the back of the hospitality community. Like, yeah. you know, we got your back. We're going to give you a voice. And we're going to highlight all these amazing things, especially in Vegas, the concentration in Vegas. And also, you know, we can't lie that we're women of color. And, you know, highlighting people of color, help highlighting women of color, highlighting people that maybe get marginalized um, and don't have as much of a voice, um, not just in the industry, but maybe everywhere. Um, so we, we also try to emphasize that. We try to, you know, introduce you to some people that maybe you've never heard of um, because of that, you know. So recently we've really tried to um, go after talking to some indigenous people and people who... Um, are trying to keep indigenous foods like going by seed and by restaurant and all kinds of interesting things that are happening in that community. Um, But things like that. And then of course we also have like the people that everybody knows, which, you know, we were very happy to have Elizabeth Faulkner, who's like huge chef competition person. If like you're into food, she's like in every chef competition show that there is, you know, or like my mentor, Susan Feniger and Mary Sue Milligan, they're famous for being the two hot tamales way back in the Food Network beginning days, like those kinds of people. So it's kind of runs the gamut of like people you need to know and that you don't know about and people you definitely know. So that's basically what it is. The, the industry out here, the food industry is probably the largest, like the culinary union is one of the, the most powerful unions across the entire country. And so there's so much reach out here and I like the the nuances that you go on and you even had like Derek Stevens on your show who just opened up Circa and I saw I watched the tour that you did of the uh, the Raiders kitchen facility for for the players and the staff so there's really all these different nuances that you wouldn't think of just like typical table service or just a traditional uh, kitchen where it's just a chef and a sous chef and a a few employees because you don't even realize it yeah I mean our there are times and there are shows for like, and you know, what I'm trying to do on the website is totally different, which is like, hopefully when I figure out my freaking technical issues, <laughs> like, I mean, cooking videos, like they're huge right now. And like, it's something that I always wanted to do, but that's like, not what we're doing at Two Sharp Chefs. Like we might have a cooking video or, you know, teach you something about how to tear mushrooms or how to make a charcuterie plate, but that's not our focus. Our emphasis is on 
getting the word out there and giving people in our industry a voice because when people have a voice change can happen and so it's not there to you know it's not like those podcasts which are awesome about you know rating a restaurant or like you know mm-hmm. like the yeah, Yelp like, kind of podcast yeah, like a lot of vegas podcasts where they do like their their trip reviews yeah and there's a reason for them like because mm-hmm. people do want to know that information you know but what makes us unique is that we are two chefs so we're talking about it from the perspective of people actually working in the industry like facing the issues that other chefs are facing in the industry and so like we always tell ourselves like when we try to book guests and we think about like different ideas like is this also serving most importantly the chefs that we had in the beginning wanted to serve so number one is them number one is are we talking to chefs? Are we talking to restaurateurs? Are we talking to people in the hospitality industry? Of course, we didn't know this pandemic was going to happen at all. So it's obviously another issue now with that. But um, it was always about them. And then as we started to do it, we realized, oh, well, there's all these foodies out here. And they're like interested because they want to hear what James Trees has to say, or Justin Kingsley Hall, or Elizabeth Faulkner or Tanya Holland or Stacey Dugan. These are like chefs where they go to their restaurants, you know, or chefs where they watch their TV show or watch them in a cooking competition or whatever it is, or a restaurant that they frequent or a restaurant that they wanted to go to, you know, and know more about the background. And so it was interesting because that kind of grew like, and then we were like, oh, okay, so we should probably do some things for foodies as well, but it also serves the restaurant and serves the chef so every single episode is always going back to okay we're gonna do sun and sundown mushrooms or we're gonna do pop and pies and it's about pies but there's got to be something in there that's also going to help a chef so something that's specific and i'm talking specifically to other chefs not just to like foodies you know interesting i like that philosophy it sounds like this is something that uh, hasn't been done i've seen a few podcasts that have popped up regarding like the industry but nothing that specific because they also they kind of bounce back to the review kind of nature and that just has been beaten over and over again so it's really about understanding the personalities of what goes into being a chef and how they can make a change because I didn't even realize that a lot of different chefs and the people of color who are in these different positions they can often be overshadowed by uh, different natures and maybe it's done purposely maybe it's not done purposely but it's good to to give them a voice right exactly and it's it's interesting to me like that goes with like how it started which is you know that voice of like chefs and like mental health issues it's like something that everybody in the industry just like in like the nightclub industry like they know but maybe people on the outside who are just enjoying our food or going to our nightclub like they have no idea like what issues are you know, being faced. And then like when something like that happens with Anthony Bourdain, they're like, holy shit, like what, why is he unhappy? Like he gets to travel the world and blah, blah, blah. And all the amazing stuff that he gets to do. And like, you know, he's got a beautiful celebrity girlfriend and you know, like all these things that seem like on the outside, what a glamorous lifestyle, you know, but he's facing like those same like issues that so many people in our industry are facing. And so, Yeah. yeah. So it's like, to me, it was just like, it was just kind of a no brainer to start it. And like, to think like, how do we speak to this when no one is like talking about it unless there's like a tragedy, right? Like, why? (laughs) Maybe we should do some sort of like trying to do some prevention. And like, that means both things. That means like addressing the actual issue, but that also means having fun. And like, it means like enjoying each other and the, um, the amazing skills and experience that all these different chefs have because you know, they are traveling around the country. Like, you know, it's like what I talked about with journalism. It's like, they're traveling around the country. They're like living different lifestyles. They're like bringing so much literally and figuratively to the table, right? (laughs) So um, it's, they're very interesting personalities. And, you know, if you listen to the podcast, like over time, you could tell too, it's like, they got some dirty mouths and like, you know, just like (laughs) these things that like, maybe you didn't know, you know, like about chefs, like, you know, dirty minds and like, just like hilarious things that make them chefs. And it's like, yeah, back at back house talk. Yeah. Back of house talk versus front of house talk. Completely two different types of dialogue. Completely. It's a different world. Like we're still, we want to do, um, we want to do this uh, like teaching thing about 
back of house terms and we just we know it's going to be hilarious because there's like so many things that back of house people say and some of it's like throughout the industry like funny stuff like there's one thing like that people say always in the industry they say chingadera do you know that one i'm not familiar with that so chingadera literally in spanish means fucking thing <laughs> so like when you're in the kitchen there's like a million uses for it you know and it's like you could be like the whitest person in the world or the most Asian person, but you use that Spanish term because there's so many Latino people in the background working, but you take on a lot of like slang, like Latino slang. And so it's funny because like people will say like, Hey, 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 grab me that chingadera or like, you know, that chingadera, you know, they're like, that's how they talk. And it's hilarious because it's like, you know, when you're busy and you're stressed out, you're like, Get that, what is that thing? You know, like, you don't know what it's called because you're just stressed out. And so it's one of those terms that you can use. And like related to that is chingon or chingona. A chingon is a fucking badass and a chingona is a female fucking badass. So it's like when somebody gets really good on the line or is like a chef that's just like cutting shit and they're awesome and their dishes are amazing, they'll be like, wow, you're chingon. You're chingona. Uh. <laughs> like, fucking badass. <laughs> Oh, but we thought it'd be funny because it's like, there's so many terms like that, that if you asked anybody, like maybe in the entire country, they would know them, you know, <laughs> it's like a secret language of chefs. That's, I, I, that's funny to see. And I think it's more interesting to see those kind of relatabilities, not just in Vegas, but once the show grows and gets larger, people from the different industries, let's say in like Orlando or New York, and they're like, oh, we have the same exact experiences. So yeah. it's really about connecting people with these uh, familiar and unfamiliar ideas. Yeah, definitely. Well, we've been talking for quite a while. I appreciate everything that you've done. This has been quite insightful. And I have to say, there's a there's often a few times where I'm podcasting and then people are just so, do such a good job at storytelling that oftentimes I forget that I'm even hosting a podcast and I'm just like <laughs> so encapsulated by the story. And that happened a, a few times during our conversation. So you are a natural at it. Thank you so much. And I've, I've found that it's like easier to talk to other podcasters mm. in general. And it's like funny because my favorite thing is like how they always have like their assets available and like they have microphones and like just the simple things in life. You know, it's like, oh, I don't, I don't have to send you a headset. Like, oh, I love that. You yes. sound so clear. Oh my gosh, you sent me pictures already. I love you. Like, <laughs> Cause it's such a hassle. Like that's the one thing like chefs are like, dude, I don't have the time for this shit. Like, <laughs> Like, I have that 20 minutes, fine, I'll give it to you. But man, like, all this other bullshit, like, I don't have time for that. Like, talk to somebody else. I'm just like, ah. Yeah, you, so, sent, yeah. Me, you sent me pictures immediately uh, when, I, when I asked you to come onto the show. So I appreciate <laughs> you for that. Uh, I ask one question to same one to everyone on the way out. Uh, most important is, what does Las Vegas mean to you? It's home. It's that general home is Nevada <laughs> motto that they have. Um, it's, it's. You know how I realized it, too. It's pretty funny. Um, I realized it when the Raiders came here because I'm from San Francisco, and I'm a huge 49er fan. Like, NFL is my sport, my professional sport. Um, I literally, like, knew Joe, Joe Montana. was one of the first people that I knew before any other celebrity growing up. Um, and so, you know, I believed, like, the, the red and gold, right? But when the Raiders came here, um, hello, they are like the opposite of the 49ers. It's like a huge controversy in the Bay Area. It's like they're separated by the Bay Bridge, Oakland and San Francisco. There's a competition between those two cities. And when the Raiders came here, I was like, you know what? I'm going to root for the Raiders too. I didn't switch teams, but I have two teams and a lot of people are at me for that. I don't give a fuck. Like, I love the Las Vegas Raiders because they're our first NFL team. And so that told me that I'm actually – a Las Vegan at this point. I'm not a Californian anymore. I'm from California, from the Bay Area, but I'm a Las Vegan because I actually could like the Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, it's like a backhanded compliment, but I love it in, so, in so multiple random. ways. <laughs> The transient na nature of Vegas, man, it just brings you in. And this, co this question that I asked to everyone, some people it takes one year to make it feel like home. Sometimes it takes a few years, but eventually people always feel like Vegas is their, their natural habitat. It took a decade. It took a sports team that I hated growing up to make me realize <laughs> that I'm actually like, I've been living here like almost as long as I lived in California at this point. So I'm a Las Vegas now. That's what hey, I am. Snaps to that. Where can all the uh, listeners learn more about you? 
Um, at Two Sharp Chefs on Instagram, that's where we're the most active. Um, you can follow me at Lorraine Chef on Twitter. Um, and then, of course, you can find the podcast Two Sharp Chefs on a Microphone on our YouTube channel at Two Sharp Chefs. And, of course, on your favorite podcast app. Hey, make sure you guys subscribe. Five stars on Apple Podcasts. That's the best way to contribute to all of us podcasters out here. Lorraine, thank yes. you for coming on. I enjoyed this conversation so much. I know I'm sure everyone else did as well because the food industry is growing and you and your mission and story is growing as well. Jake, thank you. So nice talking to you. You're so easy to talk to. I appreciate that. Thank you guys for listening and we will catch you next time.